Prices at the pump fall below $3. What drivers are saying about the trickle down. In today's cover story, what's behind a recent bump up in American paychecks? Plus, our answers about tomorrow's midterm election hidden in the stock market. Plus, Alibaba's first earnings are traders setting the bar too high for Baba. First business starts now. You're watching First Business. Financial news, analysis, and today's investment ideas. Good morning, I'm Angela Miles. It's Monday, November 3rd. In our first look, stock surged to record levels. The Dow closed at an all-time high of 17,391 Friday, while the S&P hit uncharted territory at 2018. Also in market action, the NASDAQ is trading above a 14-year high. The shine is quickly coming off of gold. Gold futures sold off $28, and oil lost 50 52 cents. President Obama meets today with Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen. They will discuss the long-term outlook for the U.S. economy. And Takata and Honda now face a class action lawsuit. Trader Scott Bauer, Trading Advantage, joins us on this Monday morning. Happy Monday to you, Scott. Good morning, Angie. The Bank of Japan gave a huge surprise to Wall Street by coming out with more stimulus. What other surprises are lurking out there, Scott? This week, the big focus, besides continuing earnings, is going to be the ECB meetings later in the week. There's some rumor on the street that they are looking at, you know, a big QE package. If they happen to announce something, boy, it is really going to be a further off to the races for this marketplace. Well, the stock market scorecard looks solid here, Scott. The Dow in record territory, the S&P above 2,000. What else is fueling this rally? Basically, Angie, it, it's great economic news, not just good news. It's great news for what we've seen over the last couple months, especially over the last couple years. The big thing that I saw on Friday was was the uptick in the GDP. I mean, that we haven't seen in quite a while. So to me, not only you know is, is job growth and employment better off, but now we're starting to see that, that GDP uptick. If that continues, boy, oh, boy, the Fed really hit this head on. Nice news to hear on a Monday. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Thank you. Lower gas prices could also pump up the economy. Chuck Coppola joins me with reaction from drivers. Good morning, Chuck. Good morning, Angie. How low will it go? That's the question on consumers' minds as gas prices fall to the lowest level in four years. I've been very happy about it. I think over by my house it's about 350, which is still a bit high, but out by my mom's house it's like 296. I live in Minneapolis, and uh, gas prices are 280 or so. So it's not too bad. There was 56 cents a gallon when I started driving. That's 35 years ago, but yeah, it's three and a quarter now. It's down from what it's been over the last year, but it still takes a huge piece out of everybody's budget. In October, gas prices nationwide averaged $3 a gallon, down 33 cents from September. Business Insider reports the drop from 2013's average of $3.51 per gallon saves typical households around $50 per month or $600 a year. Oil analysts say price drops at the pump have a way of getting consumers in the mood to spend. It's a sign of how you feel about the economy. Low gas prices really uh, people feel great about. So even if they're only saving 20 bucks, they may be spending far more than what they're saving at the pump. It's just the psychological impact of lower prices. The Energy Information Administration is projecting prices will soon fall to under $3 a gallon. The nation's two largest oil companies are spewing out profits. Oil prices are plunging due to a glut of oil and slowing demand worldwide. But the oil giants are making big money on refining. Exxon's profit rose to $8 billion, Chevron's to $5.5 billion. Exxon shares rallied 2% Friday. Chevron also had a 2% gain. In our cover story, employers are spending more for labor. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says the amount it's gone up for the last two quarters reflects the biggest increase in three years. The Department of Labor says from July through September, the employer's cost index, how much employers pay their workers, rose seven-tenths of a percent, higher than expected, and the second quarter in a row to show growth that high in three years. Some economists caution that it may not directly mean higher wages, but more people working, more hours, more in health benefits, and may begin to nudge inflation slightly higher. We're getting out of the anemic recovery. We're making good steps. We want a little bit of inflation in the economy. It helps borrowers. 
it makes uh, businesses invest now. Diane Swank, chief economist for Mesero Financial, calls it a tipping point for wages, one that's about to come because she says employers are not necessarily cutting hours of their workers. That is welcome news for those who are working for hourly pay. Average weekly earnings increased because the number of hours worked, not just the wages earned, picked up in the third quarter. They're squeezing more hours out of the workers that they have already. That's, that's my impression. Are you seeing any more in your paycheck lately? Uh, no, I mean, just cost of living raises. I mean, wages, for the most part, are pretty well static. Um, I mean, that certainly might have been static for a long time. But for holiday hires, retailers are pushing back on higher wages. According to Swank, many retailers have complained that they're having a harder time finding workers this year to man their stores, but refuse to raise wages given the razor-thin margins they have. The employment cost index comprises about 70% wages and salaries, 30% benefits, mostly health care. A key gauge of the economy is spiking. The Chicago ISM number came in at a strong 66.2 for the month of October. It's a 12-year high and shatters economists' expectations of a 60-point rise. Alice Andre France, Bureau Chief of Chicago MNI, joins us this morning. Alice, this was a huge bounce in the economic barometer. What will it mean for the national number that's coming out today? Our area economy is strong, and that will translate to strength in the national economy. It also means that you have to watch really funny things like the weather. And actually, Angie, here in Chicago, we went from shorts to snow. And what that does when you have a big cold snap like that, it requires consumers to buy goods. You'll need new coats and gloves and things for your car. You'll need to have your furnace checked up. And that all produces business. That will fuel the economy into uh, November and December. Were there any hitches in the report? No, it was a really solid report. Purchasers are telling me that they have strong bookings in November and December. The big thing here, Angie, is we do have the elections coming up next week. I am hearing from purchasers that there's not a lot of plans to get loans and for expansion in 2015. And I think a lot of that hinges on the election results. Does the report offer any inklings about China? China has been slowing a little bit. We are hearing no impact from that. We didn't really hear any impact from the, the stock decline that we saw. Um, we're not hearing any impact on our area of business from uh, the slowing in Europe. And, and that's all very good news. Thank you for that update, Alice. Thank you. For-profit colleges are under fire. The Obama administration unveiled a new set of regulations to promote greater transparency. The rules require schools to disclose graduation rates and student loan debt. Critics claim students of for-profit schools face challenges getting hired and overwhelming loan debt. The measure takes effect in July. One for-profit company, ITT Educational Services, tells Reuters the institution supports responsible regulation. In a related note, a federal judge is allowing a civil racketeering lawsuit against Trump University to proceed. Students say they were misled into believing they would learn investment secrets from Trump. Trump says he did nothing wrong. Ready, set, hack. That's what investigators are now saying about that massive breach into J.P. Morgan's system. The Wall Street Journal reports the bank's corporate challenge race website was hit first by the cyber criminals and later 76 million bank customers. The bank says all known hacker entry points were shut down in August and hackers were blocked from sensitive customer account information. Mark Zuckerberg is opening up for questions. This Thursday, the Facebook CEO will hold a Q&A session via Facebook. Users may submit questions in the comments section on Facebook's Q&A with Mark event page. The format is similar to a Q&A held with Facebook employees every Friday. According to TechCrunch, questions so far have ranged from product inquiries to Zuckerberg's personal opinions. Sales of PlayStation were about the only bright spot for Sony. Sony reported a loss of $1.2 billion for the third quarter. The tech company has lost money in six of the past seven years. However, sales of its PlayStation drove revenue higher by 7% to $17.3 billion. Sony shares closed up nearly 6% Friday to $19.81. Starbucks is out with Grande Plans. The chain will be expanding its upscale reserve coffee shops in seven Chinese cities. In the U.S., Starbucks is in the early stages of developing a delivery service. The delivery option will be offered using a Starbucks mobile app beginning next year. Starbucks shares, however, are losing caffeine. Shares fell 2% Friday, closing at $75.56. The 
Stock sold off last week on the heels of earnings that revealed disappointing revenue. Here's what's brewing on the economic calendar for today. It's the ISM index for October. Construction spending, auto and truck sales. On the earnings calendar, retail me not, Marathon Oil, Hertz, Sprint, Lowe's, Cisco and Herbal Life. Still to come, why traders are having a tough time getting a read on Alibaba in front of earnings. Plus, why Americans should care about what's new in Obamacare. And what the stock market is saying ahead of tomorrow's midterm election. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission is giving the go-ahead for an online political stock market called Predicted. It allows users to vote on events ranging from presidential nominees to the Federal Open Market Committee's Fed Funds target rate. Keeping it legal, Predicted creators partnered with a New Zealand university and they restrict wagering on any single event to 5,000 people. Individual investments are capped at $850. There's no confirmed launch date. The stock market has been known to give clues about who will win the presidential election, but are there hints regarding Tuesday's midterm election winners? Jeffrey A. Hirsch, editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac, is with us this morning. This is always fascinating to me. Are you able to tell at all what could happen with a balance of power on Capitol Hill based on stock market action? It's got less impact in the midterm year. Uh, one thing that happens around the midterm election is there's a general bullishness that, that appears. People seem to be uh, happy and, and up being able to go into the voting booths and make a change, and that tends to uh, carry over into the stock market. But what we've seen over the years is that the you know there's usually a loss of, of House seats by the incumbent president's party, but when we've had such a, a stellar economy and a, and a, and a, and a a good market situation and no major wars or recessions going on in the previous two years, the president's seat loss in the House tends to be minimal, and that's been even more bullish for the stock market. So it's a little bit more economy-based than market, you know, as in a presidential election year uh, uh, based. Well, stocks are in rally mode right now. So what can mm -hmm. investors expect from the stock market based on the presidential cycle? Well, here we are in the uh, sweet spot of the four-year cycle, the best three quarters, the fourth quarter of the midterm year, and the first two quarters of the pre-election year. We also have an average move of about 50% from the midterm low to the pre-election year high. I think that'll be a little bit softer here, but, you know, November, December, uh, January, best three consecutive months. We've got seasonals. We've got a, a, a move after the end of uh, midterm elections that, that has gains going into the last seven weeks of the year. So there's a lot of historical, cyclical, and seasonal bullish uh, uh, indications or bullish patterns converging here. And I think the economy's on, on pretty solid footing right now, and the technicals are strong. I mean, the market internals, we're getting some juice from overseas. So combination, four-year cycle, uh, seasonals, and, and fundamentals and technicals. I think we're, we're due for some more upside through the end of the year. Why should investors pay attention to the presidential cycle? It may sound like a bunch of just baloney to some people. Well, when you've got probably the most powerful person on the planet uh, coming up for election, they're going to do everything they can to keep themselves and their party in power. And that's why we have this pattern of the third year, the pre-election year, not being down for the Dow uh, since 1939. The S&P was off a, a fraction in 2011. But, you know, it's an indication of how the government can manipulate the economy to stay in power. And that drives the four-year cycle. I mean, this election every four years you know, in, impacts the market just like the moon impacts the tide. And uh, it's something that, that has proven accurate, one of the more um, consistent patterns over the years, along with some of the seasonal work that we do. Jeffrey Hirsch of Stock Traders Almanac. Come on back, please. Coming up, which one is the better buy, Alibaba or Priceline? A trader joins us for comparison shopping. And why this time around, it's not a marathon, it's a sprint to sign up for Obamacare. to control Ebola, Chimerix plans a $105 million stock offering. The money raised would be used to finance Ebola drug trials. The FDA has cleared the way for Chimerix to begin human tests. The company plans to conduct studies in the U.S., Europe, and possibly West Africa. Shares edged up nearly 4% Friday to $31.04. Bill Mahler is here with a big dose of information on Obamacare. 
Now, you remember all those problems with year one of the Affordable Care Act. There was all that confusion. Of course, the website glitches. Well, here we are. Round two of open enrollment begins in stages on November 15th. And, you know, by some measures, this could be a more challenging year than it was last year. Let's talk with Kay Bromley. She's back. She's the woman who wrote the book Employer's Guide to Obamacare and runs the site Your Obamacare Advisors. All right, Kay, uh, more challenging, and for one, it has to be because the enrollment period is half as long. Absolutely, Bill. I think that it's it's definitely going to be more confusing and more challenging because prices have not settled down. Employers thought that they had a price last year and had, you know, based on their enrollment, the insurance companies are changing prices for employers. Prices for individuals are changing, so it's very difficult for someone to even know what they're getting compared to what they're qualified for tax subsidies and for assistance. So I, I anticipate next year is going to be very challenging, also because a lot of employers are still burying their head in the sand and not doing anything about it. And there's still so many things that they could be doing, but they're just not. Well, tell us about some of the confusion that consumers might have with that point of uh, the employers aren't ready. You, you, you had 8 million signed up last year. The administration wants another 5 million this year. What are they going to face? Well, for example, you're going to have a lot of a lot of individuals who are going to go to the exchange on November 15th and apply for coverage. And they're going to tell the exchange that they were not offered coverage by the employer. Well, that immediately triggers a $2,000 per employee penalty for the employer. The, that penalty is not tax deductible, it's a tax. And the employer might later, even within the next 30 days, decide to offer insurance. And then it's going to be a matter of them proving that they are not liable for this um, this penalty. So it's going to be very confusing because of all this conflicting information. What do employers need to do? The employers need to be ready before November 15th. They need to have their plan in place. They need to communicate what they're doing to their employees. They need to have something in writing offering their employee coverage. And if their employee declines it, they need to have them sign it saying that they've declined coverage. And that needs to happen before November 15th. <laughs> I sense that maybe the 2015-2016 year will be when it first set, finally settles down. This is going to be another headache, it sounds like. I completely agree. I think even 2015, 2016, I think there's still going to be a lot of messes because the people who don't plan this year are going to realize how much they regret that decision. But we'll at least know more next year and, and we'll have a better idea of what the penalties, what are, what's actually being assessed. Kay yeah, Bromley, thanks so much. Thanks, Bill. Great to see you again. Still ahead, Alibaba is about to reveal its first earnings report. A trader weighs his options on profiting on the news. Chart Talk is next. This morning, James O'Malley of Option Hacker is joining us. He's here to talk about Alibaba, which will have its first earnings report coming up tomorrow. Exciting, James. What do you see in the chart? Right, so the chart actually looks pretty strong, but keep in mind that there's not a whole lot of chart to work with. The company has only been public for a short amount of time. Now, they're implying around a $7 move by Friday's close, which means it's around a 7% move up or down. I think it is more likely that the stock is going to sell off. It's come up quite a bit here, and there's a lot that investors are going to be looking for in this first earnings report, and a lot of ways that Alibaba can disappoint. Now, keep in mind, the last time we saw the broader market touch all-time highs was when Alibaba IPO'd, and it sent us spiraling into a near-correction mode. Here, again, we're touching all-time highs, and we're about to see them report their first earnings report, and it's a little bit too close to Halloween, so maybe this is uh, just making me feel a little bit strange about this setup, but it looks like the stock is going to head lower on earnings. I would not be looking to get long. It doesn't seem like a good risk versus reward setup to me. What do you think about Priceline? This stock has been making some interesting moves going into earnings. Right, absolutely. So they're reporting earnings on Tuesday, but on Friday's session, we saw a huge gap higher in Priceline shares, and they closed right around $1,200, $1,205. Now, the straddle is implying a move of around 55 bucks by Friday's close, which would give me an upside target of 1260 Now, I know this stock can move quite a bit, so I can't really determine what exact strategies I want to put on just yet, because the stock can be somewhere completely different going to that earnings number on Tuesday. But I will be looking to play this one with a very low risk, very high reward setup, something like an out of the money call butterfly. Okay, so if you had to choose between the two stocks to own, 
which one would it be? Priceline obviously trades at a much higher dollar amount, but I would rather own Priceline just because I have a lot more historical, fundamental, and technical data to work with. Alibaba is a stock that doesn't have any historical moves for earnings. It doesn't have a whole lot of technical data. And because they're based in China, we don't really have access to the fundamental data like we do with Priceline. I think it's a much safer play for me to be in Priceline. I like to have data to work with. Great information. Thank you, James. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, that's it for today. Coming up tomorrow, the escalating cost of running for office and the record-breaking money being spent on the midterm election. Don't miss it. From all of us at First Business, have a great Monday.